I hope you remember the Sachin Glacier, the highest battlefield in the world. In that, if you remember, the temperatures hovered with minus 40 to minus 60. The soldiers on the ground can hardly breathe, hardly eat, except the bullets. In that scenario, I used to fly. Though very difficult challenge, but that gave me the encouragement on the ground that people on the ground can sit in minus 60, I can bloody well fly. With this, I got a message. I had a couple of months to go still in that environment. I had a message that I have to go uh, on a posting and lead a contingent in a peacekeeping mission to Congo. I, I felt a sigh of relief. I thanked the God. I said, at least now I am out of uh, the fire and probably into the frank pan. But this uh, happiness was very short-lived, ladies and gentlemen. When I went to Congo, I realized, actually I have gone from frying pan to the fire. This will come to know a little later from me. After this order, off we go to Congo. First, I met up with the uh, uh, bureaucracy of the UN. I really wonder, any of you have worked or known about the bureaucracy of the UN? It's the most difficult bureaucracy in the world to work with. But we were lucky to go through the UN bureaucracy because I have gone through the bureaucracy of India. So it is much easier for me to go through there. So thereafter, I, I, in Congo, I met up with the, the team from the IEMF. The IEMF is the interim emergency multinational force led by the French people. And uh, they took me around to familiarize me in the area of Congo. They put fear of God in me. They told me about the environment of flying, first in that area. Actually, it was, they said, it's impossible to fly. He, they briefed me about the weaponry with uh, all the groups. I'm talking about the insurgents groups they carry on the ground. In fact, he's, these people told me that they have been firing at the Mirage aircraft, which is operating X. Uganda, you can imagine about the attack helicopters. As for the ground uh, position is the concern, they briefed me that on that, each and every pathway, each and every road in Congo was actually mined. So you can blown off any time. So this was a challenge. And next they informed me that one of the major of one of the uh, South African country was swallowed by a, a python. You can imagine this was a scenario which I was to take on. The soldiers we are, the soldiers of our country, they will never say die. If you can live in minus 60, he can live in plus 40 here. There is no issue. We have a confidence in our wings. We don't look at the branch which we sit on. That's a kind of a soldier which is there in India as of today. So we came back from uh, Congo. I was told to assess whether we can operate in uh, Congo with that kind of environment. I can tell you that I came back and told them that we shall move to Congo. There is nothing which can stop us. So thereafter, I was moved to a higher bureaucracy that was in into New York. I met up with the UN headquarters. Two issues came up. Uh, there. The first issue was that on the ground, the security which will be given to you will be either the Bangladeshis or Uruguayans. I refused to accept that. Fortunately, they accepted that. Thereafter, there was another issue which was that the camp, where we have to camp in Congo, they were wanting to me to be in a place called Kindu, but I wanted to be in Goma. Goma was an eye of a storm. I wanted to be in the eye of the storm. They didn't listen to me. They wanted me to be still in Congo, uh, in Kindu. But I must tell you a story here, that I took in a break of two hours. I asked them that I'll prepare a presentation. Why should I be in, in a place called Goma? I gave them an option of that I will be flying three times from Kindu to be in a, 
to be handling the operation. If I fly from Goma, it'll be much easier, and I shall be in the eye of a storm in half an hour, and if I fly from that position, it'll be taking me four hours. They still did not understand. I came up with some new idea. That's where you require a planning preparation. You have to understand that this, this is very, very important. I just told them, do you know the how many dollars which I can save you? Millions of them. And ladies and gentlemen, dollar works even in Congo. They immediately changed. They said, please continue and, and fly from Goma. So that was the situation. We came back to India. We prepared ourselves from pen to the aircraft. And thereafter, we moved. We took us 13 AN-124. The one AN-124 aircraft, a Russian aircraft, carries 150 tons. With 13 aircraft, we managed to land in a place called Rwanda. In that is the capital, Kigali. We are left alone and no one to look after us. From there, I happened to be having a satellite phone. I spoke to my boss. I told him, we are on our own. We shall handle. And that's where the leader comes in. Whenever you are a leader, if at all you've been placed anywhere, please lead from the front. If you sit in the chair and, and do not lead from the front, there are going to be no glory. Absolutely no glory. So from there, we, I led all of them to a place called Goma in buses and in, in C-130 aircraft. And we were received by nothing, just one major from Pakistan Army. He dumped us in a, in a church and thereafter he left. Mind you, ladies and gentlemen, we had nothing with us, not a glass of water. And we had to fight a war in that area. But well, fortunately, that's where I'm saying preparation and planning. I had made sure that everyone who went along with me carried the food for two days, water for two days, and a gun along with him. The posture of yours in a war matters. Thereafter, once we prepared ourselves, lived through and prepared ourselves to, to fight a war, then our aircraft, that is a helicopter, Mi-25, started, com Mi started coming in, in a place called Kishingani. We were given a one month to be in the air and to take over from the IEMF, which I told you earlier, the French-led team, into a place called Bunia. I don't know how much, how, how many of you know about Congo. Before we landed up there, five million people starved, diseased, and internal conflict died. Five million people. No one knew who was going to kill you any time, whether from the ground or from the air. The kind of weaponry which was available. So we prepared ourselves and uh, we were given a one month the Indian we are, the Indian soldier we are, I can tell you, we worked 24 hours a day, and we were up and about and flying in 10 days. This sent in a very, very clear message to the UN that there is a team which comes from India. We had given them one month, and they are ready in 10 days. I can tell you that it saved them millions of dollars from the IMF when we took over the command of the whole Congo. I'm talking about the aviation. Uh, command. We landed back, we were just about preparing, that's the time we got a mission. I led the mission. We went to a place called Bunia. From Bunia, we, we flew with our Mi-25, and uh, we had a Bangladeshi Mi-17 helicopters along with us. We were to land in one of the places where the massacre on a previous night have taken place. When we landed there, the story is very, very scary. There were a lot of human beings lying scattered all over, at least 60 bodies. Their little confidential uh, uh, message in it, I, 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 would, I shall not bring out that, but just to tell you frankly that out of the 60, there were many children. The genitals were cut. Hearts were taken out, and many more things which I can't talk about this. But it sent in a great message to you and that we have a team which can take care of now the, uh, the situation. We came back and landed back. After a few days, we had another mission. 
and this mission was that uh, incident group groups were moving towards a place called Bunia and they were trying to take over. Now this is the time that the UN have raised their hands and they were trying to approach the UN headquarters in New York. And that's where I came into. I said, give me a control for two days, you will see a change. That's where an Indian soldier comes in. We put on a cap, cap of a Mi-25 aircraft. The cap, I don't know how, much, how many of you know what the cap is all about. Cap is a combat air patrol where you can continuously are moving around the area to search and destroy if at all you find. Finally, we saw a lot of vehicles, the, the pickup trucks coming towards Bunia to take over Bunia. We had no order to fire, ladies and gentlemen, because we were then operating under Chapter 6. And to fire from the air, you require to have a Chapter 7. We, we fired a, a, a warning shot in the air, and they fired back. And that's what gave us a little incentive to fire back at them. And we used rockets. These rockets, I don't know what happened on the ground. I did not see much because I could not see much on the ground because there's so much of dust on the ground. Thereafter, the UN came up initially with the, uh, some human rights cases, but later they appreciated our efforts. I must tell you that if at all you're courageous, you have a confidence in you, if at all you have a confidence in your weapon, weapon may be a computer, you can win any war. After this, I can tell you that it took two months them to reunite, revive themselves, and once again start attacking. Actually, we silenced them for two, two months. Similarly, we had 20 such operations in, in Congo. We had to fire rockets, three times we had to fire guns, and that's how we, we, we got the UN uh, along with um, the, the bureaucracy which I was talking about. Parallelly, with what we did was something very, something very uh, unique which you probably will, uh, may not be anticipating. We were lacking intelligence. I went back to Goma. We carried out a, something known as welfare activities. In, in Hindi, it's called Sadbhavana. So we, uh, we started generating some jobs for the locals. To tell you a small thing, the locals, some of the locals were getting food one meal in 72 hours. And that's where we started offering jobs to them in our contingent. And we reopened two schools with our funds. And after that, there was no fire or there were no firing at our contingent. And wherever I went and wherever my staff went, always it was that the in Indians are the best wherever they go. Because of this approach, we won a lot of accolades from, the, uh, from my headquarters. We won a lot of accolades from the UN headquarters. And that is where once we were inspected by the UN headquarters and we were given a model contingent out of the 87 contingent operating in that area. You can imagine the Indian spirit which we have. Along with this, there were many other operations which were carried out by us, but one of the operations which I'd like to mention is, is the, uh, there are always the graph didn't go uh, on the x-axis higher. Sometimes it drops. So we had uh, a firing at us, and one of the aircraft was downed, fortunately we recovered. The another aircraft which crashed on top of a hill. That's where I informed uh, my headquarters in, in, in Delhi, and uh, I got a message back from them that uh, looking at the condition of the aircraft, we have to abandon the aircraft because recovery was impossible. But my team was not ready to leave that. 
What we did was that we, we requested the, our headquarters to give us permission to recover the aircraft. I went there. I stayed along with the team 13 days in that wild forest where we were scared of getting fired upon any given time. What I'm trying to tell you here is, is this is a story that if at all you have to lead from the front, you better be with your people. If at all you want to survive and if at all you want the people to be with you. That's where we used the locals. We moved 300 tons of soil in 10 days and, and flattened the whole top of the, top of the hill. It's a recovery which will go down into, into the history of the United Nations. We changed both the wings, we changed the blades, tail rotor, and thereafter we brought all the stuff on our shoulders from two and a half kilometers where there was the helipad. With great difficulty, we managed to stitch the aircraft together. And they, now there was a lot of issues about who is going to fly this aircraft back to, uh, back to the base because anything could have happened. Because this aircraft was just about managed well and brought on, brought on in a flying condition, but anything could have happened once you're in the air. Yours truly sat in a, that particular aircraft and flew back for 45 minutes flying. And that's how the leadership comes into this. If at all you want to lead anybody in any time in, in your life, just be a real leader. We came back to Goma. We were given a lot of appreciation from the Air Force as well as from the UN for our task which was well done in, 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 uh, in UN history. We flew back from there and came down to India. We were called by our chief into a big hall like this, much bigger hall like this, and we received uh, standing ovation from everyone, uh, from our chief and, and various other authorities. My lot of good hero pilots received many awards from government of India as well as from the Air Force. And I received Yoseba Medal from President of India.